Hello, my name is Robert Reischke. I'm a postdoc at the Technion in Israel. Um, and before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us all this opportunity to meet during these difficult times. And I'm sure it will be as successful as the test one back in May of this year. And I also hope that uh, even after the crisis that this format will uh, will be used and maybe also picked up by other conferences because um, I think it works really well. And we can um, and we can all save some uh, travel time and CO two emissions. So let's come uh, let's come to the talk. Uh, I would like to, to present you a project I've been working on quite recently with Vincent de Jacques and uh, Barry Guinard at Technion. And it's about observer effects on the galaxy power spectrum. This is, I mean, the effect of our particular position in, in the universe and the uh, values of the fields at our position um, and how it affects the observed statistics in the sky. And uh, I will structure my talk basically as follows. I will give a brief introduction to perturbation theory in, in cosmology. We then quickly move to a constraint random fields and give an example for the influence of the power spectrum uh, on the power spectrum by the constraints. Um, and I will then close with, with um, discussion and also drawing a red line to some other recent work uh, on, on galaxy clustering. And ultimately, I will then close with my conclusions. So let us um, directly jump in. So the usual story goes as follows, that um, the structures in the universe have evolved from very tiny um, structures with have, which have been imprinted by inflation. Um, and then they grow by the action of gravity. And since gravity is an inherently nonlinear um, non um, force or theory, uh, the fluctuations will eventually become nonlinear and non Gaussian as well. So, usually for the CMB, things are still in the linear regime. However, as time goes by and we absorb the large field structure today, especially on galactic scales, um, you are far, far in the nonlinear regime of gravity. However, you are also in the Newtonian regime of gravity because you are on, on quite small scales um, where you don't see the curvature very well. So, on the one hand, you have nonlinear effects just by gravity itself, um, but you are Newtonian. Um, however, this basically makes um, an exact treatment not possible. So, you can either rely now on simulations um, to, to solve this problem, or you, if you want to do it analytically, you go, for example, to effective th theories or to kinetic field theory or something else. So if you go to effective theories, you basically stuff all the all the unknowns beyond a certain scale into effective parameters, which in case of the bias expansion would be the bias parameters, which you then have to fit self-consistently uh, when you analyze the data. Um, another important thing is that you can separate scales to some degree. So for example, for structure formation on large scales, the details of star formation or the very details of galaxy formation will not be important. Um, and in the talk here, I will focus on the effects on the very largest scales where perturbation theory is first of all applicable um, and um, where another effect becomes important, which is the effect of general relativity. Because as I said, if you are on small scales, you can calculate most of the things Newtonian in a Newtonian way, but as you approach the size of the horizon of the universe, then you might take into account um, relativistic effects because you're now in the strong field regime from a gravitation, from a GR point of view, because you, you observe um, you're on the scale of the horizon. So um, therefore these effects become important. And this leads me basically to the, um, to the, uh, Next slide, where I discuss what is actually an observable in cosmology. So for this, we have to remind ourselves, first of all, that we only have access to information on our past light cone. And 
this immediately tells you that uh, the conventional density contrast, as you define it on the spatial hypersurface of, of constant time, is not a proper observable. Um, and the question now is, of course, what can we actually observe? And there are basically two, two things which we observe in cosmology. And this is some angle, a position on the sky, um, and some kind of distance proxy, which could be, for example, a redshift, a flux, which you then convert by the luminosity distance into, into uh, some distance estimate. So if you, for example, consider galaxy clustering, um, what you should do is you should not take just um, the matter density and you modify it with a bias to relate the matter density to the, to, the, uh, to the galaxy density, and that's it. But what you should do is you should basically start from this expression here. So the over density of galaxies at an observed position and observed redshift is basically given by the local density at these observed positions by the local volume, which might be distorted to the, uh, to the basically Friedman volume in this patch of the sky. And then, you do, and then you subtract the mean and you divide by the mean. Okay, and these things have been calculated to um, first and second order by several people. Um, so for the first order calculations, I've listed a few, a few here. And for Chalinor and Lewis, I will give you the, um, the expression here. Um, and I would like to explain to you a few terms. However, so what you see, first of all, is the, uh, the usual density contrast delta. So this is the total number of galaxies. That's why you have the one. So um, this would be the mean um, or the global mean of the Friedman or its more the universe. Okay, so you have the bias, which relates the density contrast here, which is in synchronous gauge to the um, to the galaxy uh, galaxy over density basically. And if you if you have only Newtonian um, without also without retro space distortion, you would basically stop here. However, there are some other effects like as I said, retro space distortion, which are uh, which are related to to the velocity. Then you have uh, distortions to the co-moving distance or to the proper time. You have lensing here in the form of kappa. But also you have, have these two terms here, which are the Badin potentials, um, which uh, can give rise to like, um, so first of all, they can give rise to zucks wolf like effects. But also they are, they are here. And an important aspect of these things is that since we are working in a synchronous gauge here, we can relate those to to the density contrast delta by a Poisson equation. As soon as you apply the Poisson equation and you translate psi to a delta, you pick up a k to the minus two in Fourier space. So if you now push all, this whole expression to Fourier space and you make a correlator and you take with the power spectrum of the galaxy, uh, of the galaxy density contrast, if you want, what you will find is that, um, so as you know, the usual density contrast um, goes with, um, goes with k to the one on large scales or um, an s if you want, but something close to one. Um, and if you now have terms which are modified by k to the minus two and another k to the minus two, because you calculate the correlator, you will get divergent terms which diverge with k to the minus three. And these are the um, usual terms which one uh, has picked up in the calculation of these effects, so that on very, very large scales where you approach the horizon, these terms become dominant over the other terms and can lead to a huge effect into this divergent behavior on very large scales or very small wave number k. Um, one minor detail here in practice, um, ng is computed relative to the observed mean and not the theoretical global mean, because this is unobservable. But uh, this is just a minor detail. I will come back to this on the next slide as well, but um, just a uh, yeah, just a small detail. Okay, so what happens now if we put an observer into the into our random field? So the way to go would be then constrained random fields. So we consider a cosmological random field f of x, which is supposed to be statistically homogeneous and isotropic. Okay, um, this is what I mean with cosmological random field, and we put an observer at the origin. So now we have to keep in mind that if we if we observe the universe, what we are doing is we only have a single realization. 
but uh, we observe statistics not by ensemble average but by spatial averaging over different patches in the sky and uh, by ergodicity we, we assume that this is a well or a good representation of the ensemble average um, now we assume we have a singularization which with a certain value f o at the origin where the observer is um, so F itself can be any field. It could be the gravitational potential. It could be the galaxy field, whatever you like. So F not might not even be observable locally, but it still has an effect by its correlation on the statistics you might see. Um, and now what you can do is you can compose, as shown by Hoffman and Rieck in, back in 91, you can decompose this field into a mean and a residual field, which we call delta F. And you can now start to correlate the correlation function, or uh, compute the correlation function of this delta f. And what you immediately see is that this now explicitly depends on x1 and x2, and not only the difference. So this psi f would be the unconstrained correlation function, which only depends on the, on the modulus of the difference between the two vectors. However, you get a correction here, which basically breaks the homogeneity of your field. It's still isotropic. It only still depends on, on the modulus, but uh, it also depends on R1 or the, the absolute value of x1 and x2 explicitly. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a slight difference. Um, so the observed fluctuations are basically a bit different from delta f since you estimate, estimate the mean from a single realization, which is basically from the data. So if you have a patch in the sky, you average over everything, or if this is your field of view or your survey, you average over everything, and this would define your mean, which might already differ from the global mean, which you can't, which you can't tell in the first place. So now, since statistics are usually carried out in Fourier space in cosmology, let's go to Fourier space um, and see how the how big the effect is. So what we do is you estimate the band power, um, which is just you take the Fourier modes. You square their amplitudes and you are done. You just divide it by the volume because you have more modes if you have a lot of volume. Um, and then you would like to know what does it actually estimate. And we can calculate the average of this estimator, which now is an average subject to the constraint that we have. Um, we have the value F0, FO at the observer, so at the origin. Uh, and it's not just a random, it's not just an ensemble average over all field configurations. It's only an ensemble average over field configurations such that f naught is the value of f at the observer. Okay, and what you see here is that this um, so this is an approximation because usually you have a have a window function in your survey um, and um, other stuff which we ignored here for the moment to 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 show you just this result. So. You have the normal power spectrum, and then you have a correction term, which also which goes with the power spectrum squared. It's one over the volume of the survey, and this is the variance of um, the unconstrained field. Now, how does it how does it look like, um, or how big is this effect? And for this, I want to show you this picture here. So you have here the wave number k. You have the power spectrum, and we now take Badin potential, for example, which um, which diverges at low k and then falls off very, very steeply at larger k. So we've picked three surveys here, which, which have a volume of 1 gigaparsec cubed, 10 gigaparsec cubed, and 100 gigaparsec cubed with the different line styles. And we have the unconstrained field basically in, in red. Um, and uh, the, line, uh, the, the, the average of the estimator we have in, with the different black lines. The horizontal lines here mark the fundamental mode of the survey. So everything to the left of, the, of, this, of this vertical line um, is not observable for the survey because it's, it's a super, uh, super survey mode, basically, which is bigger than the survey. Um, the shaded areas show cosmic variance. And what you can immediately see is that for each of the surveys, um, the difference between um, the unconstrained field and the uh, constrained realization in the 
the power spectrum difference is well within cosmic variance. To say for this, we assume the term in brackets here is of order unity. Right? So if you have a very unlikely fluctuation, for example, um, then it is entirely possible that, uh, that you get very huge results. But this is very, very unlikely. Um, because you compare basically the, the value at the origin to the typical fluctuations of this field. Okay, so um, if you now do the same exercise in spherical Fourier Bessel space, you take your field and you uh, expand it in spherical harmonics and uh, spherical Bessel functions, then uh, we find um, that you can uh, absorb everything basically in the monopole, which is uh, by definition not, not observable and which you are not interested in. So if you have a full sky survey, um, then you are fine basically. And this was already shown by, um, by these two papers here. Um, so let me now jump basically to, the, uh, to some discussions of the results. So first of all, um, I would like to like to make uh, a point about these diversion terms I, I uh, found before. So there was a paper quite recently by Grimm et al, which discussed these diversion terms. So let me remind you: the diversion terms go with k to the minus four times the power spectrum of the matter, um, which goes with k to the one on very very large scales. So you have a divergence with k to the minus three. Um, okay, and this these terms become important again on the scale of the horizon. Now the problem is, um, or the, why this is interesting in the first place, is that you find a very similar signal um, when you look for primordial non-Gaussianities in the power spectrum, for example. You find a very, very similar signal on very large scales. So this why is why this is interesting. So now, however, recently, as I mentioned, Grimm et al argued that these divergent terms are not physical and that they can actually be removed um, by taking into account the contribution by the observer. However, what we think is that um, there's, a, there's a small problem in the argument or in, in how, they, how they treat the observer because they average over all possible realizations at the observer. However, what you should use is um, the constraint statistic and not the unconstrained one which um, will basically give you back the, uh, the, the divergence on, on large scales. OK, so I will come to the conclusions now. Um, so what we did again is we studied the impact of a particular point in the universe on the, um, the values cosmological fields have at our place on the statistics of these cosmological fields. And what you can immediately see is that the existence of an observer breaks the homogeneity of the underlying fluctuation field because it's constrained to be, to have a single value at our position. And then due to the correlations, you get a radial basically dependence on um, of the statistics, which then, um, which depends explicitly on which radius you take in this direction and which one you take in that direction. However, we found that the effect of this is, if you take a free analysis, is small for most scales and only becomes, let's say, noticeable on very, very large scales, which approach the fundamental mode of the, of the survey. If you have a full sky survey, you can, ob you can absorb everything in the monopole. So um, in the sense that um, ergodicity holds for these for these surveys in the, in the in the usual way that you can average over different different um, patches of the sky and uh, call this basically an ensemble average. So now, while um, go, going back to the to the second point, while you might not be able to observe the gravitational potential um, or other unobservable. Um, effects on at the which are not observable locally um, at the observer they the effect that they have a certain value here translates as a statistical report, response into observable quantities which is still 
in the short noise regime for let's say likely fluctuations if the fluctuation itself is not too uh, too unlikely um, but this in principle can be measured and with this uh, i would like to end my talk and yeah, i hope you enjoyed it and have some questions for me